Dear students, welcome to our course Environmental Modeling and Simulation. In today's lecture, we are going to go over some of the simulation techniques, both deterministic and probabilistic. As I mentioned in the previous lecture, deterministic is when we are trying to determine the exact solution at any given time for given variables or set of variables. Not all systems can have a deterministic solutions in which case it is typically a good idea to use probabilistic based simulation. Now in probabilistic based simulation, the result is a probability of different possible outcomes, different possible outputs, different variables, different values. In my experience, many students try to use the highest probability output from probabilistic functions or probabilistic simulation as their determined answer, which is not the right way of interpreting probabilistic models and probabilistic simulations. So let's get started and in this lecture I'm going to go over many different methods that are used for both deterministic simulation and probabilistic simulation very briefly. Remember this is an introduction to simulation and we will not be going through much detail with each simulation technique. So let's start with deterministic simulation approaches. Now deterministic simulation approaches are typically taken straight out of deterministic optimization techniques. If you have taken optimization technique courses in past or numerical method course in past, you must be aware that optimization techniques help us optimize a given function. Now in context of optimization, we might be looking for the maximum value of the function or minimum value. We might be searching for local minimas, local maximas or global minima and global maxima. And based on the optimization algorithm, our answers might be slightly different or the computational power required for the simulation might be different. Now deterministic simulation approaches include heuristic approach, random search approach, pattern search approach and I am very briefly going to talk about each one of them. So let us start with heuristic approach. Heuristic approach is mathematically the simplest deterministic simulation approach. Now mathematically it is very simple but it is also very widely used and it is more of intuitive and exploratory approach which means that uh, it is quite possible that the optimization approach itself is not very efficient. But it is very easy to use and it is very commonly used. So in heuristic approach what we do is we set input parameters. Now you can have conditions on how on basis of which or reasons why you set a particular input parameter to begin with and that is your starting rule and then the simulation or the optimization begins. And at every step of the st simulation and optimization, there is what is known as a stopping rule. So stopping rule could be let us say particular parameter becomes less than a particular value or error if you are looking at optimization, the error becomes less than a particular value. So stopping rule is decided by the simulator and it also depends upon the kind of model that you are trying to simulate. So this is very important, setting your input variables and deciding your stopping rule. So if the stopping rule condition is met, the heuristic approach stops simulation and says, hey, this is my answer. So after setting the input and input is set at many different levels, the simulation is carried out and then the response function, there is another term called response function. So we look at the value of the response function and if it is matching or if it agrees with the stopping rule, we stop the heuristic approach. And if it is not matching the stopping rule, the simulation continues, it uh, modifies your step and then it again looks at the value of the response function and so on and so forth. Now one problem with heuristic function or heuristic approach is that it can end up being a blind approach where it is easy to get lost in the simulation space. This is a warning when using heuristic approach that what we set as our input parameters, where we are starting and what our stopping rule 
is we have to put a lot of thought into it. Typically, people who are very experienced in a particular kind of model, a particular kind of system, are able to make good decisions if they are using heuristic approach. Or we learn by mistakes. The second approach that is commonly used in deterministic simulation or deterministic optimization is complete enumeration and also random techniques. Now, complete enum enumeration techniques are typically used in discrete cases. They are not used in continuous cases. However, random techniques, it sounds like the technique itself is random, it is not. They are typically also used in continuous cases. So, in complete enumeration, all the variables must have finite number of values. They must assume finite number of values. That is why it is complete enumeration. We are completely detailing the whole system. So, all factors must assume finite number of values. That is very important for complete enumeration. Now, but if your variable number, your factor number is very high, then complete enumeration technique can be very computationally challenging or just very resource intensive, not necessarily the most efficient way to get your simulation done. For example, if I have three factors and each factor has five levels and they have their own replication, I can require anywhere up to 300 or even more runs of the simulation, which is quite inefficient. Alrighty, in the random search technique, it is very similar to complete enumeration when all factors must assume finite number of values. So, what we do is we select inputs at random though because it is a random technique and then it is slightly better than complete enumeration technique. It reduces the number of simulation required which is a big drawback with complete enumeration and the way it does is it because it looks at the value of your response function and it decides optimal point at every step. So, it is a very smart technique compared to complete enumeration. The next technique that is used is response surface search. Now, response surface search is a simulation technique. where we have an n-dimensional surface. So, let us say you have an n-dimensional model and you are trying to simulate it. So, you might end up with an n-dimensional surface which is hard to visualize but yes, we have n-dimensional surfaces and we use them in a response surface search technique. So, what we are trying to do is we are trying to fit a polynomial with n variables to the performance function jv. So, remember in the previous ones we had response function and the response function is how we decide how well our optimization is going on, how well our simulation is going on. In response surface, we have a polynomial that we fit to the performance function, which is not very different from the response function here. And we are trying to fit a polynomial to it. Again, if it is first order or quadratic order, this is typically easy, you can transform, you can even do the simulation. It becomes very interesting when your number of variables is very high. And in response surface search, what we are trying to do is, once you are fitting the polynomial to the performance function and you have this multidimensional surface, we are looking for the parts in the surface that have steepest descent. So, I will write that down here. I mean, I hope that helps you with note taking. We are looking for path of steepest descent. So, in response surface search, we follow the path of steepest descent and once there is no longer improvement, let us say we are following the path of steepest descent and we are going down, we are looking for minima. Once we notice that we are not able to go further down, we are like, okay, we have come at a place that appears to be a local minima. So, that information is used by the simulation to find out the new optimal point or maybe not find the new optimal point and say simulation is over. Again, depends on how the performance function is answering. Or we can take the path of steepest descent and try to reach for maxima and then when you notice that there is no further improvement, we might be like, okay, we have reached a local maxima. We definitely want our response surface search to be applicable and efficient over a wide range of response surfaces. But however, that is quite a challenge even today when you are using the response surface search method for simulation, deterministic simulation. And this is typically a problem when we do not have unimodal surfaces. Just to be clear, unimodal surfaces are surfaces that have one local maxima, one local minima. 
which is their global maximum minima. When you have multiple local maximum minima, response surface search may be an, it may be an issue. Think of Mars rover trying to find minima and maxima, and once it reaches a minima, it's like, oh, this is the minima. But if you are in a crater filled planet's surface, there might be a deeper crater somewhere else that you might miss when you're using response surface search. People have figured out ways to overcome this problem, but then it has other issues. So we are still, this is still where people are making advancements. The next is called as pattern search technique. Okay, this was number three. Okay, coming back to response surface search, remember I shared with you just now that there are methods to improve this limitation of response surface search that does not work very well for non-unimodal surfaces, non-unimodal systems. So one of the very common technique that is used to overcome this limitation is known as the Las Vegas technique. Fascinating name. And in this technique, what we do is we look at each local search, we take each local search, each local search has a corresponding search number associated to it in Las Vegas technique. And then we notice how with each search, what our local search information is regarding the steepest de descent. And then we plot it and we notice that if any local search is giving information or is showing a descent that is greater than other previous local searches, then we say, all right, this is important. We need to fit the curve here. We need to fit, uh, we need to fit the curve to the data using this. And basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to project estimated incremental response. So we notice with each local search how the response is changing and we use that to figure out the best approach for the optimization or the simulation to move ahead. And the search will continue until the value of estimated incremental response is less expensive than the cost of computation, the cost of doing one additional search. Because notice in simulation the more longer your program runs, the more expensive it is and maybe there are more errors or it's just computationally more intensive. We want to reduce that. So we'll continue doing this as long as there is improvement in estimated incremental response and it is not more expensive than the cost of additional search. Pattern search technique, there is an assumption and the assumption is that any set of moves that improves, that is successful in improving your optimization is worth repeating. So basically in pattern search technique, if the program figures out that when I do these, this pattern movement, then we, I reach closer to my minima or maxima, it will keep repeating it until there is no further improvement. So it follows the same pattern over and over again until there is no further improvement, in which case it will try to change the pattern. Now the fun thing about pattern search technique it, is that it tends to have what is quite similar to dynamic step process. So what it will do is every time it notices that certain pattern or certain move or set of moves is successful in optimization, it will repeat it again but with a smaller step. So it's trying to get closer and closer to the actual minima or maxima that it is looking for. When it notices that repeating the pattern with the smaller step is not working anymore, then it takes a bigger step and again looks for the pattern that works, the set of moves that work. So notice one thing, in response surface search, a limitation was, let's say we have a one dimensional surface, all right, then this is non-unimodal and you have minimas and maximas throughout this, in this particular domain, so this is a minima, here's another, another minima. So I have identified multiple minimas already and then we have maximas, these are local maximas. So in response surface search method, let's say it's starting here and it's looking for steepest climb, it will find the steepest climb. And once it reaches here, it may be like, oh, yeah, this is the maximum and most beneficial and most optimized condition, which is not true because you see there is a global maxima here. Or if it is looking for global minima and it is starting in a place where it will be stuck in the local minima, that might be a problem. In pattern search technique, what it does is it keeps trying to improve. So let's say it notices, the algorithm notices that when I'm moving, when I'm making a set of moves in this direction and I'm looking for a maxima, then 
there is an improvement in my response function. So, it will continue making progress in the same direction, but with smaller and smaller steps. So, it is trying to inch its way towards the local maxima. And once it notices that there is no more increment in improvement, there is no further improvement, then it will start taking bigger steps. So, it does not forget the answer here, but it takes a bigger step and it may end up in a place which allows it to explore the next maxima or in case of minima, the next minima. And then once it has explored the surface like this, then again, see, once it takes a big step here, it will take another step and say, all right, this step works. From here to here, there is some improvement, there is some increase. We are moving towards a maxima. And then you will start taking smaller steps in the same direction, keep climbing. So, this is a more rational way, pattern search technique. It's a, it has a dynamic step which makes it quite useful and quite efficient. Another thing to notice, like response surface search, this is a one dimensional surface that I drew here, but typically depending upon your model, you will have an n dimensional surface. Same thing with pattern search technique, you will have n dimensional surfaces. As I said, they are very hard to visualize. Thank God we have computers, thankfully, to solve our problems for us. The next is, the fifth one is conjugate direction search. Okay. Now, conjugate direction uh, search is interesting because it does not require estimation of derivative. Is not required and yet it is able to optimize n dimensional quadratic surfaces. The quadratic surfaces is the function that you are trying to optimize, that you are trying to simulate. And typically uh, it uses, uh, to optimize the n dimensional quadratic surfaces, it will use n iterations and it keeps redefining the dimensions. So, what it does is, let us say you start with n dimensional quadratic surface, it will use n iterations and then it will modify the surface, it will redefine the dimension. How does it modify the surface? By redefining the dimensions. So, it the dimensions are varied here, it keeps varying the dimensions and, and the reason why it is called conjugate direction search is because the dimensions they are conjugate to each other. Two dimensions. are called conjugate directions if they are cross product. Is all 0, then they are called conjugate. So, the conjugate direction technique what it tries to do is tries to find n dimensions, a set of n dimensions that will describe your surface, your optimize the model that you are trying to simulate, that you are trying to optimize perfectly. So, it will describe your surface perfectly such that each direction are conjugate. That is why it is called conjugate direction search. And we can also use single variable procedures, we can have multiple number of dimension, number of variables is not an issue here. So, in conjugate direction as I mentioned that each direction, each dimension are conjugate to each other. So, their cross product will be equal to 0 and at each step of the optimization, it will define the n dimensions, it will use n dimensions to explain the surface, to model the surface better. And then it will try to find the search options that are the optima that can be used to replace the dimension by two optimal points. So, it keeps on replacing these conjugate directions with optimal points and successfully replacing the original dimension will give you a new set of n dimensions. So, basically it keeps on modifying the dimensions to define the surface, to explain the surface and uh, actually this is the reason why we use quadratic surfaces. And another thing about it is that it also can select the step size much like pattern search technique that uses dynamic step, it can select the step size that is most optimate for this particular simulation. Now, the thing is that because at every step it is defining new dimensions and the dimensions are conjugate. So, what is happening is that your space is undergoing axis rotation. Thing with axis rotation is that step size 
that you used in the previous dimensions, let us say in first set of n dimensions will not be same once you have rotated the axis, the step size will change once you are defining new dimensions. So, that becomes a problem when we are trying to understand what is improving uh, when we are using conjugate direction simulation technique. This is one difficulty that we have with conjugate direction technique. The next is steepest descent technique, it is the sixth one that I am talking about briefly. Now, steepest descent technique should remind you of uh, response surface search which uses the which follows the path of steepest descent. Now, in steepest descent technique what it does is it uses a fundamental result, fundamental property of calculus and what is this fundamental property of calculus? It is that the gradient, remember gradient in one direction is dx by dt or dx by whatever you are changing. So, let us say in our face portrait the gradient was x by y or r by j whatever our slope of the line or curve were. So, the fundamental property in uh, understanding in calculus is that the gradient will point towards direction of maximum increase of the function. It uses this property to look at the gradient and decide where the steepest descent is maximum increase of the function. So, at any point it will look if the gradient is pointing in this direction then it knows that in this direction the function is going to increase in opposite direction the function is going to decrease. Once it has made its step it will look at the gradient again in the new step and then it will decide in which direction the path of steepest descent is. And this is how it decides that initial parameters that you have given to the simulation program how to change them and to what extent. Typically quadratic functions are used for steepest descent but that is not a requirement but much like the previous one the conjugate direction typically like where, there we had quadratic surfaces here we tend to use quadratic functions but again it is not limited to quadratic function. The thing is that the beauty of quadratic function is that any change in the variables we can assume they, they are linearly related among each other. So, if, if we are having small changes any small changes in the variables then the resultant effect on the function and other variables would be linear only for small changes. So, that is a very important a very useful assumption that we can make and use when you are using the steepest descent simulation approach. One limitation with steepest descent is that if you have an n variable system, then your surface where you are trying to find the steepest descent will have n points around the point that you are trying to investigate because you have n dimensions, you have n variables. When n dimensional elliptical surface is not the case, we are going to extract parallel tangent points, this sign is for parallel from bitangents. and inflection points, inflection points of occluding surfaces, occluding contours. Okay. I do not expect at this level for students to understand how to do this, but if you are interested in using steepest descent simulation, this is what you need to do. Now, let us look at another method of deterministic approach. This method is taboo method and some people write it taboo, some people write it taboo like the English word taboo and there is a reason why it is called taboo method because what does not work it taboos it. The beauty of taboo method is how fast it will figure out where the optimum point is. Like if we have n dimensional surface with multiple local minima, local maxima and we are trying to find out the global minima and global maxima, taboo method does a very good job in quick exploration of the surface. So, briefly it is a very good uh, method for figuring out the local optimality in your surface. And what it does is that it is looking at the space, it is exploring the space by slowly moving from one solution to its best neighbor. So, whether it is trying to minimize the function or maximize the function, it once let us say you have set the initial parameters, you have looked at the response function variable and you have your initial solution of your function, your function that you are trying to simulate or optimize in this case. 
and then it will try to move from the solution to the best neighbor. Best neighbor is the, the nearby solution which is better than the existing solution. So it makes an exploratory move to move to the next best neighbor. Now it's quite possible once it moves to the best neighbor, its function value reduces like the performance function. will result in deterioration of the performance, right? We will say that moving to the best neighbor has actually deteriorated performance. That is also a possibility and uh, what it does is that it is basically okay deciding that okay this particular move did not work and the reason why it is moving to best neighbor is to avoid local op optima. So in this case in one dimensional model we had multiple local uh, optima whether it is local minima or local maxima. So once it has figured out that this system, this particular solution is my initial solution seems to work well, it will move on to other neighbors. It will see okay, where else what data I am getting, where am I getting an improvement. It is known as taboo method because it says that once you have reached a solution that looks nice to you, its immediate neighborhood is banned it's taboo and the reason is because it wants to take a far leap. It wants to explore what's happening at far enough distance not just in the neighborhood. So once it says like okay uh, we have made local improvement it takes a big leap and that's why it's called taboo method because it taboos, it declares as taboo movement in the immediate neighborhood once something has been optimized. Once we have figured out the solution like okay if you go back to this diagram we say that okay somewhere here we get very good result. Now the problem with taboo method is that it can take another jump and go in a place which is far away from the solution. But once it starts approaching a solution that it looks good to the model, it starts intensifying its analysis here and it figures out pretty successfully where the global maxima minima is. Now once it has figured out the maxima in this case or the local optima and it takes another jump and it says that it is not working, it can revisit its decision. Some other methods that are used in deterministic simulation are hook and G's method. In fact, the list is very long. I cannot cover the whole list unless I'm teaching a course dedicated to simulation techniques, deterministic simulation techniques, which is not right for engineering students anyway. So hook and G's type techniques are a group of techniques. They are not just one technique and they use two moves. One is exploratory move which is very similar to the, to the taboo method and the other is a pattern move if you remember the pattern search method. And then we have the simplex technique 8, 9. Simplex techniques uh, which have initial sim simplex and they build it from there. And then the tenth one which, is, which are very commonly used now are genetic techniques. So they use genetic algorithm and the genetic technique is basically you know how the genes evolve, they have orthologs, homolog genes, part of the genes will evolve, there is mutation happening at a natural rate, mutation accelerated by human pollution. We use the same random mutations that happen in genes, we use them to randomly change our variables, our input parameters and see how our function is getting optimized or not. Genetic technique is surprisingly very efficient, very effective and very widely used. So these are the 10 techniques that we looked at starting from heuristic approach, complete enumeration random techniques, response surface search, we looked at pattern surface technique, conjugate direction technique which has conjugate directions, uh, dimensions and they and at each step there is some rotation of axes that happens which messes up the step size so that is a challenge. We have steepest descent technique taboo method which is very good at, at exploration and then we have hook and jeep type techniques, simple X and genetic techniques. But deterministic simulation techniques are not limited to these 10, there are many more. Something for you to figure out, these 10 are very commonly used. Okay students, this is all for today's lecture. Thank you and see you in the next lecture.